Hey, where the heck are you guys going? I can't possibly have offended anybody yet. I just got here. How's everybody doing this morning? All right. I always like to feel out the room a little bit. That was surprisingly good. Uh, it's usually pretty terrible. So my name is Brian Pagano. Uh, who the heck is this guy? Some of you remember me from Google and some other gigs I've done. I'm now Chief Catalyst over at Axway. This will not be an advertisement in any way, shape, or form. I know some of you are really disappointed about that. A big part of my life is flying around the world helping companies to be successful and equally to avoid failure in APIs. And so if all your stories start with, so I was in an airport, like I do, you start to spot some trends. You start to spot some anti-patterns. And I'd like to discuss a few of those with you guys today, if you don't mind. First, a quick reminder of what is at stake. Because you know, here we are in the Bay Area. I live here in the Bay Area. We get really into our frameworks. We get really into our technology. We start to forget, is this feature, is this little thing the difference between somebody being successful or not successful with their APIs? I think we all know in the room, in this room especially, you guys have self-selected into this track, that it's often not about the technology. I was talking with some customers last week. And they said, you know what happens if our API management system goes down? We're out of business, at least for that day. Maybe not permanently. Let's not exaggerate. That's the kind of thing that is at stake here. This is really an existential moment. And I think it's so easy to forget that when we're all here high-fiving at the, at the API conferences that when we're working for our employers, for freelancing, helping businesses, whomever, we're building these APIs, we're consuming these APIs for somebody, in 2019, that API is their open for business sign. That's a reminder of what's at stake here as we, as we continually chase the new shiny. All right, Brian, let's get to some trends. Stop scaring everybody. All right, so what happens? Probably my favorite place in the world is Japan. What happens when I land in Tokyo after passport control and things like that? Everyone gets there and says, hey, Brian, we're so happy you're here. We love your videos and your books and you know, everything like that. But it's completely different here in Japan. And a week later, I'll fly over to London and do a FinTech conference. And everybody will say, oh, Brian, we're so glad you flew over here. But everything's different here in the UK. Right? And everybody says, oh, but it's different in manufacturing. It's different in retail. Right? It's different in media. And my response to everybody is, it's 2019 for everybody. Right? In Japan, I had everybody hold up their phones. What do you think I saw? All iPhones, all Android phones. What apps are on those phones? All the same apps. Right? Everybody in every vertical, we have this, we have this idea that every company is somehow unique and special and in some little stasis bubble. And I just kind of want to remind everybody, and I know you're the smart ones, right? Because you're in this room. Right, you're the smart ones, so you know this, but it's just a good reminder that we should watch out. In fact, good architecture, right? Avoid special cases. It's uh, symmetric the whole way around. So what does this mean in practical terms? Well, to do business in 2019 effectively means that all of your employees, partners, and customers, users, to speak broadly, are expecting self-service. You know what most companies suck at? Self-service. You know what else they're expecting? Uh, real fast time to market on the devices that they love. They're expecting a fantastic user, user experience. You know what most companies really suck at? UX. Yeah, so we see, this, we see this big discord between what companies are traditionally strong at and what it means to thrive in 2019. Right? Companies generally try to do all the coding internally. Well, how are you going to do that if you're making Xbox apps and Tesla apps and all these kind of things? No, nobody's got those kind of resources. Uh, You've got to connect to the rest of the world, right? Who's, who's building a walled garden in 2019? People are doing it. Probably somebody in this room is doing it. Uh, you know, when I would fly to Minneapolis or wherever, talk to the big retail companies, I said, so what's your game plan here? What are you doing with the APIs? Well, first off, we want to build a, a new shiny app that will work for iPhone and Android. I said, I don't get it. So, no, we want you to have this app. Brian, you said you're a customer of ours. 
you know, you're going to download this app, right? I said, wait a minute, you want me to download an app for every single store I shop at? You want me to have 150 retail apps on my phone? That seems like a reasonable game plan to you. Right? APIs aren't about building your own app. APIs are about getting your button and everybody else's app. Again, I get wild up about this stuff. I'm not yelling at you guys. I know it sounds like that sometimes. You're the smart group. You came in here. I appreciate that. Uh, and then one-stop shopping. That's a part of the, the walled garden, right? I shouldn't have to go to your site, then go somewhere else to see a Google map or go somewhere else you know, to find the store locator or to, to complete my transaction. You should be working with the rest of the ecosystem, which screams APIs, as everyone in this room knows. What I tell customers when I, when I fly around is that all things being equal, because I say, Brian, help, you know, you've worked with lots of the big brands out there. You've, you've helped make them tons of money using, uh, using APIs. What, what's the secret? What do we do? And I said, well, you know, you're not going to, there's no single big mistake you're going to make. There's a lot of little mistakes you're going to make. But all things being equal, if I don't know a lot about your business or your current state, you should act like a retail company. And yes, I told a tractor manufacturer in the Midwest this thing, and they looked at me like I was crazy, which may or may not be true. That's orthogonal to the point. They need to act like a retail company. Because if you're thinking about that user experience, if you're thinking about your, your, your API as a product, right, as you're thinking about your brand as a product, um, like the retail companies do, you're thinking about self-service, you're thinking fast time to market, you're probably on the right track. So what other trends are we seeing out there? Again, some of these will seem obvious. In fact, at least one of these will seem obvious to everybody in the room because these are the trends. These are what we're all seeing out there. One of the interesting ones for me is hybrid because I see so many companies and so many consultants and so many developers and architects, and they seem to be planning for either a 100% on-premises legacy world or they're planning for 100% in the cloud world. I mean, come on, how many companies are 100% in the cloud right now? Probably just Google and Amazon, right? But so the reality is, is that everybody's hybrid, so why are we not architecting for that, right? Why are we not thinking about that? Probably popular at this conference here is the brewing religious battle between uh, native apps, right? Do I write this thing in Swift? Or do I do a cross-platform app using one of these cool new frameworks that are out? And I am totally sympathetic with both sides. If you think I'm going to give you the answer, I don't think the answer's been written yet. And if I could predict the future, I'd still be on Wall Street just investing money or build a time machine and go back. The answer is what makes sense for your company, right? Because I get wanting to have one app for everybody. And I also get that users vastly prefer the native apps, which means you have to manage multiple code bases, right? There's no, there's no great answer there other than what is the market saying? What are your users saying? Because it really is, in 2019, all about the user satisfaction. Now, I really debated about putting this, this slide in here because you know, here we are in the Bay Area. This seems so obvious, right? Except when, and I could have pulled some, you know, the TOB index and things like that and showed you the actual numbers. But as I was looking at the numbers, you know, the top three or four metrics, uh, places that measure which are the popular technologies, right? Which are the popular languages out there? I was so astounded by how many of the legacy languages still accounted for so much of what's going on out there. Which, again, is just a reminder when we're at a conference like this in the Bay Area, and we're in the future, and everything's four-dimensional, holographic, everything like that. We've got the new frameworks and the new technologies, and it's a lot of fun. We do have to remember that probably the back end, right, the stuff we're talking to, is going to be some really legacy stuff. So far, we're doing well, because uh, very few people have walked out. I offended that guy, right? That's, it's just going to happen, right, Anytime I'm on stage. But so far, it's been pretty good. So either you guys are all playing Pac-Man on your devices, or I just haven't got to the offensive stuff yet. So what are the things that are causing companies to fail? Not a surprise, it's not the technology. Right? We forget that all the time. Um, you know, listen, when I'm out there acting as an advisor to companies, uh, and they're saying, well, Brian, should I go with your employer? Should I go with a different vendor? Should I? I said, you know, as long as you're going with one of the main couple of products out there, one of the main cloud providers, right? You don't want to go with Billy Bob's muffler and cloud. As long as you're going with one of the main API providers, you know, that kind of thing, yeah, you're probably fine. 
right? That's, that's not the difference. I said, well, yeah, but you, know, you guys have this feature and they have this feature. Again, is that feature the thing that stands between you and success? Is that really, if you look at companies where their developer program never took off, their API program never took off, companies that failed, that just couldn't make the pivot into the digital economy, was it because they chose the wrong vendor? Was it because there was some feature missing? I don't think so, right? I think they just missed the pivot completely. To that point, one of the first questions everybody asked me, probably some people in this room, but we'll, we won't point anybody out, is what do I measure? Like, how do I even know if it's successful? So I, I'll land and they'll say, Brian, we want to have a wildly successful API program. What does that mean? And you know the first thing that everybody says? How many raw API transactions do we have going through the system? What a useless metric, right? What, what does that tell you at all? That could all just be bot scraping from a competitor or something. That, I mean, raw API transactions tells you nothing. Or they're worried about how long is it going to take me to get set up? Like, if I'm going to start locking down my APIs and securing them, or if I'm going to start monetizing my APIs, or start adding analytics so I get uh, you know, regulatory compliance auditing, how long does that take? Who cares? And that's the wrong question. The question you should be asking me is, what does every day after that look like? Right? Initial setup is a one-time kind of thing. And then this legacy, and you guys are probably some of them, some of you are dealing with this at your employers right now, which is how can we add more and more governance to our API program so that we don't have any duplicate APIs? This blows my mind, right? Because APIs are lightweight, they're thin, they are very inexpensive. The people asking this question are sincere, right? They're not idiots, they're just saying, in the old days, the legacy systems, when you're talking about duplicate back-end systems or back-end services, that's heavy. That's expensive. That's the kind of thing you should be watching for. But who cares if each department builds their own API and they have, you have duplicate functionality? Honestly, that is not the big problem. Anybody offended on that one? No? Everyone is okay so far? Anyone need a hug? You doing okay? All right. Somebody in the back does, but it's going to take me a minute to get back there. I'll catch you afterwards. Um, so what's, the, what's one of the big mistakes I'm seeing out there? Mistaking modernization for transformation. Mistaking modernization for innovation. It's really easy to do. And frankly, everybody's doing it. Say, hey, Brian, we got some workloads running in the cloud. Great. It's 2019. You need to do that or you're not going to survive. But you understand you've just done old things in a new place. That's good. I mean, you need to do that. The danger is when you start thinking, oh, I've checked off my transformation box. I've checked off my innovation box. I love this picture. I don't know where it came from. Uh, I've been using it for years, right? The early days of the automobile. Um, this guy is so happy. He's got one of the first cars. Most of these people have never seen a car before. He's thinking, everybody on the side is looking at me thinking, this guy's awesome. And everybody looking at him is thinking, this guy is an idiot. Right? He's got 100 horses inside the car. But he doesn't know how to use them. Instead, he's pulling it with one. Right? He's doing old things in a new position. We want to avoid that. Another major mistake is focusing on the wrong variable. So another common question I get, in fact, some of you will ask me this at the table uh, after this, uh, Brian, we want to monetize our developers. How much do we charge developers for joining our API program? That one I have an easy answer for. If your company name is spelled A-P-P-L-E, $99 a year. <laughs> if it's not, Zero. That's not how you monetize. That's not how you make your money. Right? You want as many developers as you possibly can. You want as many partners as you possibly can. You want a, a huge sea of applications out there just driving consumption, driving business. That's how you make your money on your existing channels, not by charging uh, developers who want to use it. Uh, premature optimization had a, one of the giant telcos here in the United States. Obviously, they're, they're worried about uh, you know, latency things like that. If you've ever worked with a telco, you know they don't have a, a great sense of humor about that kind of thing. And they spent millions of dollars on their API program, and nothing was happening. And I said, well, here's what you need to do. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, but what about the latency, Brian? What about the latency? And I said, you have no apps. You have no developers. You have no partners. The day you have a latency problem, I will buy you dinner. Because that's a good thing, right? Then that means you're wildly successful, you're going to get promoted, and uh, you're going to buy some more stuff from us. So it, it's terrific. 
Uh, and I mentioned before counting raw number of API transactions. I put it on here twice because it's just that bad. Everybody's asking about it. One of my hobbies is philosophy. I try not to drag too much of that on stage so you guys don't have to suffer through it too. But I, I put this in a lot of my presentations because I think I'll go to some, you know, some of you will say, Brian, could you talk to my boss? Could you talk to our CIO? Could you talk to some of the folks and, and get them to see the light? And I'll go in and they'll say some of the right words, but they don't really want to pivot. They just kind of kind of want to ride the legacy revenue streams into the sunset. They're not, that, they're not that far from retirement. I don't know, their kids are in college, they just want to ride it for a couple more years. They really don't care if the business goes out, goes out in a few years. And my point to anybody who's giving me friction at some of these sessions is, you know where you're headed, right? And if you don't make a change, and change, a like good transformation, like a good sandwich, is always messy. Bell leadership, right? Yeah, you thought this wasn't going anywhere, but there it is. Um, so I always get asked, even from my old Wall Street days, I always get asked to try to predict the future. Even when I was at Google, try to predict the future. So let's say this. In the next couple of years, the only companies that are going to survive are companies that are API first. The only companies that are going to survive are companies that do digital transformation, right? They transform themselves. So all the things we looked at earlier, fast time to market, UX, not being a walled garden, self-service, all, all those things. If what we're positing is the case, if that's true, and in two, three years, those are the only companies left standing, who's going to win the next round? I know some of you might be dubious because it actually takes a while. So I grew up in Rochester, New York, which was the home of Eastman Kodak. Anybody remember Kodak? Yeah, exactly. You guys are laughing. You know exactly where that goes, right? And it was my entire life was a bloodbath. Every quarter, some VP's department would get laid off, right? Your neighbors, families would lose their jobs. It was just horrible. But it took us about 40 years to destroy what was the largest employer in the area. About 40 years to take what was a blue chip, you know, Dow 30 stock to bankruptcy. And so when I'm flying around the world right now talking to customers, I don't think they're lying to me. I think they really believe that they have more time. Right, a few years ago, right, uh, not long after uh, Apple launched the App Store, so a little bit after launching the, the iPhone, I was in in Toronto, Canada, talking to a company at the time called RIM. They changed it to BlackBerry. Anybody remember BlackBerry? Yeah, you guys starting to spot the trend here. Um, this is usually the part where some people start saying, Brian, you suck at your job, man. You're supposed to talk to companies to, to help them be successful, and you're telling about all these companies that didn't make the, make the pivot, right? But these guys, we forget what kind of market share they had, right? I mean, Apple was a, was a rounding error at that point. And so when I talk to their CIO and I talk to their CTO, they thought that they had all kinds of time. Right? I don't, and I don't think it was illogical for them to think that. And at the time back then, right, that was about seven years ago, I was just guessing. I was saying, I don't really think you have that kind of time. I think you need to make this transition right now. As it happens, they were focused on the handsets and the hardware mistaking the revolution. They thought that was the revolution, those touch screens that worked so well, so amazingly well, even on Rev1. But the real revolution was the App Store. Right? And they just kind of missed that pivot. Likewise, I worked with a, a company called uh, Blockbuster. Anybody remember Blockbuster? Yeah, right? This is a smart group. You guys get it. You missed the digital pivot. Now we know what happens. Six, seven years ago, I was guessing. Now we have the data, right? Now we know what happens. So when I'm suggesting that you don't have 40 years anymore. I mean, these companies, think about BlackBerry, Blockbuster, these, they were number one in their space by a huge margin. And they're gone. So who's going to win this next round? Data. Data is the currency, right? If we're transforming into this digital economy, user experience is a close second. Data is the, the, the currency. So really, the question becomes, who gets the most value from their data? In short, the answer to the question, Brian, who's going to win the next round, is who's getting the most value from their data? What that really means is who's a platform 
and who's using machine learning. Both of those things scream out for APIs. Right? How are you going to be a platform? How are you going to make any kind of ecosystem? How are you going to make any kind of marketplace? How are you going to do that at all with, by doing you know, one-off custom connections without using APIs? Right? I have a slide that I sometimes show that shows the most valuable companies in the world 25 years ago and shows the most valuable companies in the world last year, where we had the last year we had complete data. 25 years ago was the companies you would expect, General Motors, Exxon, right, those kind of companies. And who was it last year? Yeah, Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, exactly. And somebody always shouts out, hey, Brian, I get it, they're all Silicon Valley companies. Wrong! I mean, they are, but there's a lot of Silicon Valley companies not on the list, right? And, you know, oh, Brian, I get it, they're all software companies. Wrong! I mean, they are, but there's a lot of software companies out on the list. What's, what's so special about those companies? They're all platforms. They've all found a way to tie their success to the success of somebody outside of their organizational unit. Technologically speaking, how do you do that? APIs. APIs are magic. You guys knew the answer to that, because this is an API conference. This is a picture of a giraffe. Now you guys are impressed with the thought leadership. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you knew it was going to be a good day, but now. So my, uh, my baby son just, just turned one years old, and he just loves giraffes. So I put this in. Yeah, so you're saying, but okay, I get that part, Brian, but why would you show this to an auditorium full of people at an API conference? Because sometimes our users just want a picture of a giraffe. Right? I see a lot of heads nodding. We get, we, here in Silicon Valley, we love our new technology. We love our products. We love the latest shiny. I just think it's so easy to forget that most of the time we need to help our companies and our users get more pictures of giraffes. All right. We have a minute or two for questions. First of all, everyone's psychologically OK? I know I get uh, really fired up about this stuff, because I don't want anybody else's companies to fail. I don't want to have to tell any more stories like I have to tell about some of the others we talked about earlier. I want you all to get promoted. I want you all to be heroes. I want your users all to love you and have great experiences. And I'm probably a customer. I'm probably a user for most of your apps. And I want to have a great experience. But if everyone's psychologically OK, are there, are there any questions? So everyone's in awe from the giraffe, huh? Just processing that still? Maybe any specific yeah. questions about yeah. giraffes? <laughs> I can send you photos. Well, I've learned He's that the little things on top are called ossicones. Yeah. Uh, information I didn't know before I was a parent. But there, we've got a question. So you mentioned not using um, like API transactions or monetization as key metrics for developer programs. Yeah. Is there a rule or a set of metrics that you try to drive companies towards? Yeah, it does depend a little bit on the context, meaning what kind of vertical or what you're doing. Obviously, if you're retail, something, something like um, number of, of completed monetary transactions or something like that. But I think most of the time, things like NPS and some kind of user experience metric are one of the best ways. Because right, everything else, you can kid yourself about everything else. But if those numbers are high, you're fine. And if those numbers are low, you're not fine. Um, depending on how you're monetizing, there's usually some financial metric underneath. And then depending on the goals of the organization, if it's to build a marketplace or an ecosystem or something like that, I would look at more like how many entities, how many organizations, either subunits of your own company or partners or whatever, are on board and actually actively developing, you know, like kind of an active user metric. Uh, and then, you know, if we were to sit down and talk about your specific business, we'd probably have a few more. But, uh, you know. That's, that's roughly, if you do those things, you probably have conditions conducive for success. And thank you for not asking about a giraffe. One more question. There. She's running. Hey, good morning. Thank you. I don't need a hug, but I give you a high five. All right, virtual high five. Yep. Um, I'm from Wells Fargo, and obviously I'm going to be thinking about security here. So when we look at our flexible models with the data models, 
and how they could potentially influence, you know, some of the APIs. What are some of the first, the vulnerabilities that you're really concerned about as companies like Wells Fargo move towards using um, some of these banking as a service models, et cetera? Yeah, so I'm a Wells Fargo customer. Thanks for my mortgage and everything like that. Great. Um, I'll be on time, I promise. We'll protect, um, we're gonna protect your data. That's what I love to hear. That's why I love that question so much, because I am a customer, and I'm glad that, that uh, things like security are not an afterthought. So I, I love to hear that. Um, I would say, for, again, all things being equal, without going deep, is um, separation of duty, right? So I'm a, I'm a reformed software architect. That's how I spent a lot of my career. And I like to make sure the right thing is being done at the right layer. As you know, software architecture is a bit of a, an art more than a science. You move one lever up, another lever goes down. You can't have the most secure system in the world and the fastest system in the world. It just doesn't work. What I would say, what would make me feel better, sleep at night as a, as a Wells Fargo customer, would be if I knew that at your API layer, you were looking at things that should be looked at at the proxy layer, right? Not so much the data structure. I'm, I'm less worried about that than I am what sorts of validation, what kind of defense in depth happens at each layer. I would not like to see you trying to apply complex business rules at the API layer. It's a wrong layer, right? The, the proxy layer should hand off to something else. I would want to make sure that there is some kind of rule engine behind it. I would want to make sure there's data validation layers and data access layers behind that. I say, I know you guys have it, but I've seen companies that are wiring their app directly to the database, and then I can't sleep at night. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's, so, I would be much less worried about the structure, the data structure, the format of the payload that's going back and forth with the API requests and responses, as I would be that there's a solid defense in depth, against I'm, I'm X Wall Street myself, making sure that you've got the right uh, controls at each layer. Great, thank you. And also thank you about asking about giraffes. Okay, you guys have been fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian.